today on rambling about cars it's the ford bronco and do you know ford bronco history we're going to put that to the test today because we're talking all about the classic bronco and we've got help from ford to do it ladies and gentlemen fanatics of ford it's podcast time i'm christopher smith across the way as always is mr chris bruce what's up bruce nothing much doing great and happy about the show because we yes. have ted ryan Ford archivist with us, and we are going to be talking about all things Bronco. Classic Bronco, middle period Bronco, kind of it's death in the 90s, and it's coming back now. Um, so, Ted, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Ted Ryan. I'm Archives and Heritage Brand Manager for the Ford Motor Company, which is a fancy way of saying I'm the archivist. <laughs> uh, I'm excited to be here and excited to talk about Bronco, one of my favorite topics. Outside of Mustang, maybe Bronco is my favorite. Well, and GT. You can't not talk about GT, but they're all my we favorites. Need, we, we need to be very careful. If you can see the shirt that I'm wearing here, we need to be very careful to stay on topic for Bronco because I could I could talk Mustang and and, and some GT stories as well. So just real quick, do you just want to give us a very brief Bronco overview just from from your perspective? Happy to do so. I'm not going to go through all five no, generations. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The origins of the Bronco go back to World War II. That was actually the, the Jeep is the origin of the Bronco. Uh, Ford was one of three companies that submitted designs for the Jeep. The body style was Ford's. The engine was the famous Willis Overland engine and powertrain. And poor Bantam, while they were the first one to, to bid, not much of the Jeep was theirs. So the body style, that the classic uh, look and feel of the Jeep was a Ford design. So after the war, uh, there's a lot of surplus Jeeps on the market. And the GIs who had returned from the war, they loved them. Outdoor people loved them. So there's this outdoor uh, enthusiast off-road market uh, that's dominated by Jeep, which at this point is Willis Overland, and by uh, International Harvester Scout. Ford sees a small hole in there. Uh, the Scout and the Jeep are not comfortable. They're bumpy, uh, they're durable, but they're bumpy. So we decide that since we've been building the MUD, which was our follow-up to the Jeep used in Korea and Vietnam, uh, we've got the four-wheel chops, So, but we can build a city driver and an off-road vehicle. Thus, the Bronco is born. Uh, designed between 63 and 64, launched on August the 11th, 1965, as it goes anywhere, does anything vehicle. People love it. There's three different body styles. I won't bore you on that, but they're very popular. But the wagon is the by far the most popular. The interesting thing with the Bronco, it's selling well, but it never had its second generation. The uh, oil crisis happened in the 70s, and uh, the Bronco slated second generation didn't happen. So it stayed in its first generation form. It did get power steering and um, uh, automatic transmission in 73. Uh, until 1978, 79, when the big Broncos come out. Those are the ones based on the uh, on the F-150 platform. They're popular. We sold 100,000 a year in uh, 78 and 79. People love those. It's, the, you know, the, in the Bronco world, you got the first gen, you got the second gen, the big Broncos, they call them. And then generations three through five essentially uh, were the same, but with different trim kits or with safety features added and with the various uh, updates and technology added between 90 and 96 when it went away. Very good. And you know, so it's history, um, history of Bronco in three minutes. <laughs> great. <laughs> no, hey, hey, there's, that's right straight to the point. I want to, I want to just jump back to, uh, to what you were talking about, how it was designed from 63 to 64. And then in 65, we have it. I mean, today we're so used to seeing, a development process for some vehicles that like like the supra bruce that was what i mean we we were watching super prototypes for like years and even to some degree um i mean the current bronco had a had a, a fairly long um development period but just back in the day things were just so much different back then to go from oh, okay 63 64 here's something that we're just make it up completely new boom and it's out i mean is that is that really how it went i mean was it that straightforward it was that straightforward but keep in mind too uh, the, the mustang had a longer period because it was more experimental but the bronco we've been building mutts and mm -hmm. you know the mutt is essentially uh, uh, a heavier duty bronco uh, in fact uh, one of the documents I, I sent you had a comparison could we take the mutt 
and just make it a little less ferocious and turn it into a street car. So, so that is doing- actually one of the images that I pulled up. It's funny that you mentioned that. It, that is that document right there. And what it <laughs> says, and it, if you don't mind me interrupting, is that the Mutt had a unit cost of $2,391 at the time. An F100 4x2 had a unit cost of $860, which is just like, that's a shocking difference. And they do, <laughs> as you re- go on to read there, they do say that with some changes, they think that they can get the difference down to 482, but still Ford only thought they could make $26 per unit on a consumer version of the Mutt. And and if you're watching the YouTube version of this, you can see the very next line is Bronco underscore. (laughs) And that's because they're like, we're not gonna make a consumer version of the Mutt. We're going to build this thing that we're calling the Bronco, and we're going to aim it against the Jeep CJ5 and the Scout 80. And I guess the story goes from there. Um, but and I found it, that document it, fascinating. It's amazing what you can learn when you look deep enough and you try to discover. And uh, did in one of the documents, they, they actually had the anticipated profit for a Bronco, even with the redesign. And even then, I want to. I'm going from memory. I think it was fifty three or fifty seven dollars per unit. Uh, and you know, the 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 profit margins weren't ex, you know they weren't exorbitant in uh, in these vehicles. But to to the initial question, the the design cycle was shortened because of the experience with the mud. They knew what they were doing. They knew what they were after. And that design sketch that you popped up there for a while, that was actually drawn by McKinley Thompson. Mac Thompson was the first African-American automobile designer who worked in Detroit. He came to work at Ford Motor Company. He graduated from the uh, design college in Los Angeles. And while he didn't design it, no individual ever designed the vehicle, uh, Mac Thompson penned the earliest sketches of the Bronco. Uh, he later went on to work with the F-Series and was, was heavily involved with the redesign of what eventually became the F-150. Uh, and that's actually why I pulled this image up is that it's interesting that you get a very much of that period in 1965, 66 F100 kind of design from the sketch we're looking at now that has, it has a narrower grill and you see the Ford, um, the Ford emblem, well, it's not the emblem, the badging above that. And it, it also this is just a modern thing. I love how skinny the A and B pillars are, or the A pillar specifically. Like, yeah. I wish, hopefully someday we can get back to that. But just look at how airy that cabin looks. Um, but yeah, it's I, I didn't know that about that, but that, that's fascinating, yeah. So when you see those drawings, just keep in mind that's Mac Thompson and, and how significant it was that, mm. that he was uh, the one that designed it. And you also notice the horizontal nature of the initial grill. Right. Uh, What's interesting is the initial design of the Jeep that Ford did uh, during World War II had the famous vertical grill, and it oh, drives yeah. the Jeep folks nuts to know it. But, <laughs> but that vertical uh, grill pattern that's you know current in the in the existing Jeeps was actually a Ford design. Uh, and the the drawings that went out, you know, and the Army wanted Jeeps to be able to be built by everybody. That's why they sure. meshed together all the designs. But the actual design specs, the design drawings actually had Ford stamps down in the bottom right-hand corner, even as they were being built at willis Overland in Toledo. And also as, I, so Bowling Green, where I live, is about half an hour south of Toledo. So thank you for saying Willis rather than Willys. That that means a lot. Very good. <laughs> well, and, and we should also mention or point out, uh, especially for some of the younger listeners out there, um, when we're talking about Jeep in terms of World War II, we're not talking about jeep has a manufacturer which i i don't think existed at, at that point well, it was no. willis overland at that right, point right the the jeep was a, and i can't remember specifically but it was an it was basically an acronym for acronym the acronym gp yep for for the army's rugged yeah. um you know you know small compact off-road vehicle so when we're saying jeep in this regard we're not talking about the automaker we're talking about that specific specification for the military that ford was involved in Right. I think yep. GP was general purpose. It was a general purpose vehicle that was just supposed to be that. Um, and yeah, like Ted was saying, American Bantam, Willis, Ford, they all yep. kind of contributed to the vehicle that did that. And then after the war, Willis bought the trademark around, mm-hmm. I think, 1950. I'm not a, I'm not a Chrysler historian. I'm a Ford historian, but it is <laughs> around 
I think it was around 50 or 51 and Ford could have bought it, but we didn't buy it. Uh, so that that's how they took control of that uh, J-E-E-P trademark. It was being called the Jeep, you know, all during uh, the GIs had shortened GP or lengthened GP uh, into uh, the word Jeep. And mm-hmm. uh, they uh, well, was bought it from the, from the government after the war. And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna say, I'm kind of glad that Ford didn't buy it because I mean, that set up what we have going on here today with the sort of the rivalry between the Wrangler and Bronco. And I think that's part of the reason. Yeah. I, I think that's part of the reason why there's, been such hype about the Bronco coming back because for a long time, the Wrangler didn't really have any competition. So bravo to Ford for not making that decision. And yeah, so the vehicle we're looking at here now is much more the classic. This is what the first gen Jeep looks like. And I believe this is a clay model that you sent us. Am I right? It is. It's a clay. You can see down in the bottom uh, left-hand corner, it's dated 12, six, uh, that's 63. I can't quite make it out. 63. And then just for the eagle eyes, that S number that's there, that means that that negative was shot in the styling lab. At the end of every day, whatever was being, whatever was in the styling lab would be shot. So you can see that's negative series 6904 and dash two. That means the two is it was negative number two. And there might've been 30 negatives in that envelope and each one would be numbered sequentially. That's fascinating. But yeah, that's what this is much more compared to the other drawing that we saw. It has the full grill, full length, larger headlights. Like a lot of people would look at this and say, this is a first gen Bronco. Mm-hmm. Yes. Easily identifiable. Uh, first generation Bronco wagon. This is the wagon style with the removable roof. Well, why don't we go ahead and talk a little bit about that first generation? Because as you mentioned, there were actually three versions when it first came out. There was the uh, there was the sports utility, there was the roadster, and then there was the wagon. And uh, and the wagon was the most popular by far, correct? Wagon outsold them all uh, easily ten to one. The roadster wow. was essentially it was as basic as you could get. <laughs> Doors were options, roof were options. I mean, it was it was nothing. And then the sport utility was this kind of funky hybrid pickup truck looking uh, uh, version of the Bronco. But you know, by the time you're buying a roof and a door for your Roadster, you've already got a wagon. So why not mm-hmm. just buy the wagon and and uh, be set there? Oh, you got it! Great. I was yeah. just about to pull that image up. <laughs> yeah, we we actually have a a brochure of the '66 Bronco that that Ted sent over, uh, where we can see all three of them there. And I'm just, you know, I'm trying to put myself in the mindset of 1965. How different of a vehicle this was for the time. Um, there was there was uh, some documents that you you had sent over, where they were talking about some of the different features and options. And um, and I think one of them was, you know, locking locking hubs for the front wheels. And in parentheses, it said two required. And I just love that they had to specify two of those are required here. You know? Yeah. And if you think about it, too, but keep in mind what the what the that little narrow corridor, the, the Bronco is trying to appeal to. And when you watch the first TV commercial and you read these brochures, it's touted as it goes anywhere, it does anything vehicle. Uh, I love the TV commercial that shows a woman driving to the grocery store and it says, no, no annoying wine when you're, um, uh, when you're driving on the highway, uh, or when you're not in four wheel drive. And it's, it was designed to be an off-road stalwart, but at the same time, be a comfortable highway driver that anybody and the family, uh, would enjoy driving. Now was not, that's not what Jeep and Scout were. And right. we always forget our West coast brethren, the, the Toyota Land Cruiser. You know, it's, that's it's so funny. You mentioned that I was talk before we had you on, I was talking about how it was funny that they compared it against the Scout and the uh, Wrangler, but didn't mention the FJ 40. And so yeah. it's funny that you bring that up. So, now, uh, now how many, how many, um, how many accessories did it have? Cause as we were going through the documents, it seemed like Ford thought of just about everything to try to outfit the Bronco for. Well, they did. Cause that's where the money is. I mean, that's the, right. that's the dirty little secret in the automobile industry is the money's <laughs> in the accessories. Uh, what I'd say the profit expected profit per unit was about 53, $55 somewhere in there. Uh, well, if you get them to buy a radio and you get them to buy a snow plow and you get a, a winch and 
You know, your profit margin on the accessories is so much higher. And uh, frankly, they took that from the Mustang model. Uh, you know, the Mustang was exact. I want to see we veered off. The Mustang was exactly the same thing. Low cost, mm -hmm. uh, the base unit of the Mustang. But if you want white walls, if you want a radio, yep. if you want air conditioning, if you want this, if you want that, everything added up. And it and it uh, increased the core price of the car. Uh, it's a, a crazy stat. It's like uh, eleven percent of all the Mustangs sold the first two years did not have a radio. Uh, can you wow. imagine not buying a radio for your Mustang? Uh, so the Bronco is the same way. That the money, yeah, the accessory brochure is popping up now. If you want yeah. enhanced shocks, if you want this, if you want that, everything uh, you can have it all. Uh, it's just a little bit more expensive. Yeah, mm -hmm. a radio is forty six fifty five. But if you want the antenna. If you want yeah. that antenna, that's five seventy <laughs> extra. Yeah, but you, we you don't know, need no stinking antennas. What's no. the cost? What's the cost per unit on a radio? Twelve bucks or something like that. So you know they're making yep. almost as much. I'd say they Ford is making almost as much money selling the radios because we own Philco, by the way, as we are uh, selling the actual cars themselves. Well, it it never occurred to me, and I never realized that uh, that Ford sold snow plows like through Ford. I mean, I, I don't think that yeah. still I, I don't think that still happens, but you can see it right here on the image we're sharing. That was snow plow, yeah, a snow plow from the factory. Yeah, yep. and and I I have to say, to me, the Bronco seems a little small to be a snow plow vehicle. You had to but, fill the back with you had to fill the back with sand or with weight. To, yeah, yeah, a little little extra weight, but at the same time something that size is going to be far more maneuverable and get you into areas that are going to be a lot harder to reach with a, you know, with a larger truck. Speaking, of, my, speaking of somebody, one? yeah, as speaking of somebody that used to live in the, the uh, Lake Michigan snow belt for several years, <laughs> one, maneuverability one my, matters. One of my favorite Ford stories is in the documents. I don't think I included in what I sent you is uh, somebody at a cocktail party stopped Henry Ford the second to tell him that the snowball did not work very effectively with the Bronco. Uh, and so Henry Ford dashed off a blue letter uh, to Iacocca saying, why doesn't the snowplow work? And Iacocca sent it to the engineering team. It's a folder that's easily an inch thick of executives at Ford scrambling, <laughs> trying to, to frame a reply back to Henry Ford uh, the second to say, it does work. You just have to put weight at the back. <laughs> I, no, I, I, think, I think that was in the documents. I can't, it's, it's a fun read. It, it really is a fun read. Um, let me see if I can bring it up here. No, I've got, I don't have the original letter, but I do have the, the letters that you sent us here. I will share them here in just a moment. Um, that, yeah, that there is this whole correspondence between Ford engineering and, uh, Henry Ford, the second about, um, hold on here. This is going to be the easiest way to do it. Uh, about yeah, yeah th th questions there it is. There it is. regarding um the snowplow. <laughs> Subsequent so you to your here. questions concerning the adequacy of the Bronco snowplow, we, we have, have reviewed the design and revised. installation of this equipment, and we find it satisfactory, satisfactory and competitive. And competitive. <laughs> December third, nineteen sixty-five. So it probably snowed over Thanksgiving. Someone asked him, and things results happened. <laughs> it did. If I remember right, the, the person that actually asked them in the first place was on our board of directors and was associated with one of the large supermarket chains. Uh, <laughs> do you also note the blue color of that uh, correspondence and all correspondence that took place at Ford uh, at a, a executive vice president or higher was on blue pieces of paper. Henry actually oh. had his uh, Henry Ford the second had his own paper. It was kind of a magenta color. Mm -hmm. um, and they did that. It's just like seeing an exclamation, uh, exclamation point on the incoming email you know it's important <laughs> yeah so you see yeah. blue you see blue paper and you know it's important well i mean i can just i can just kind of picture this going on back in the day of everybody trying to because because i've i won't name any specific places but i've worked at places where it's like okay the boss just said something like we need to figure something out to to respond like now so i i can just i can picture this happening i'm not sure it was probably I don't think it was probably very comical then, but the image in my head now is is rather comical. I gotta say. Yeah. <laughs> um, so just so Smith and I, we both have a love of old press images and drawings and things things <laughs> like that. And I just wanted to share real quick one that I really liked. Um, let's make sure. Yeah. So 
we're speaking about accessories and you see the snow plow, snow plow there at the bottom. But I just love this drawing of this kind of cowboy chasing this calf, but then at the same time showing all these Bronco accessories. I think it, it, it's both evocative, but also just beautiful. It, I, I just really enjoyed that shot. Well, they, and, and it joined the family because if you think back to 64, 65, 66, that time period, the Mustang was introduced and mm -hmm. it brought in the, the horse theme and the Western motif, the Bronco, the horse theme and the Western motif, the Maverick a few years later, the horse theme and the Western the Pinto motif. a few years yeah, later. And the Pinto. And um, that was by intent. That was uh, just as on the GT Mustang side, it was total performance on this side. It was durable off-road and it had that whole Western freedom. The, the feeling of freedom would be the best way to describe it. Well, what I, what I really like is, is that, I mean, we're not just talking about Bronco, for the west right i mean we're talking about uh, I'm, I'm looking through some of these other images here right now is that it no let me get this one up here <laughs> yeah oh, i like I mean, this one too I, I mean the safari bronco where i mean this was all over the world look at this yeah and then uh if you haven't followed them already you need to follow broncos of iceland on instagram uh broncos it's, it's, of iceland Broncos of Iceland, it's a strange quirk of fate, but in 68, there was a large over uh, overstock of Broncos and an uh, enterprising Icelandic uh, Ford dealer bought them all hmm. and sold 1,200 Broncos into Iceland that, that, in that particular year. If you think about it, durable, off-road, uh, Icelandic uh, weather, the rocky conditions, and uh, for a while, it was the largest per capita population of Bronco owners in the world was an ice <laughs> and the Broncos of Iceland Instagram follow is a, is a uh, Instagram feed is a great follow. If you don't follow them already. Well, can I, can I jump us for a moment from Iceland to Arizona? Because I really want to know a little bit more about this, uh, this curious vehicle. Um, it's the gas sniffing Bronco. Oh, right. that was fantastic. Yeah. And it was, uh, if, Outfitted, the Bronco is outfitted to patrol the streets of, of the city in Arizona and sniffing for natural gas leaks. Uh, you could do anything with your Bronco. We sold a bunch of them uh, to law enforcement, to fire, to uh, National Park Service. Uh, heck, we even sold a bunch of them into uh, New York City for Central Park uh, Patrol. Uh, and so it was, it was your off-road vehicle for almost anything. I love that guy in the back, by the way, with the sunglasses on. Like that guy looks so cool. <laughs> the, the, this guy over here. Yeah, yeah. that guy. <laughs> he's got some. He's got like some seventies tech there, and he is. He is. Maybe he's just been sniffing a lot of gas, but he looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I, I'm not totally knowledgeable on the Bronco, but I thought, okay, I've got a fairly good idea. And then as you start getting into the history, I realize, wow, I really don't. And and it's it's sort of no wonder why there's such excitement for the Bronco coming back now. Ted, what um what don't we know yet about the Bronco that you want to tell us? Well, I I'll frame it in the form of a question. And and uh to me it's it's so Interesting because the story arc on the Bronco is it's great, it's great, it's great, it's great. And then in the early 90s, it's not great because it only has two doors. Uh, there's this whole theory of the boomer and the reverse boomers. So all the boomers had their kids and that reverse boom generation, they're the soccer moms and dads and they're throwing the gear and the football gear in the back of the car. Well, Bronco only had two doors and you know they also want a comfort. We don't want just two doors. So by the, by the 90s, the writing's on the wall. So I think in 96, I'm going from memory, but it, I think maybe 9,000 units were sold. So the Bronco's on its way out and it's limping out the door. So how did the Bronco become a pop culture icon as it limped out the door in 96? And it, it's a fascinating question to me. And I, I think that it has as much to do with the look of the first generation and the, the passion for the second generation. Yeah. Because did you see the sales numbers? I, I did actually pull that up. It was 107,000 was, was its best year in 79. Yep. Like the, that, the 
So, you know, I believe the second gen was introduced in 78. So 79 78. was kind of the first full year mm -hmm. and it was yep. its best year ever. Like, Correct. And we, we only sold 1.16 million of Broncos during the entire 30 years. So how did it, I mean, we, hell, we sold that many Mustangs in the first year and a half. <laughs> uh, so how did a car that only sold a little bit more than a million units become this pop culture phenomena? And I, I wrestled with it. And I, I think it has as much to do with the movies, um, the songs, you know, it appears in, in music videos. Uh, Lady Gaga put one in her, she owns one, and she put it in one of her music videos. It appears in all these great movies, uh, Ocean's Eleven, you know, uh, it became this symbol of something that was different. And both Broncos, I mean, if you go back and look at Longmire, that's a, what is that, a third generation? And the car is as much of a hero of the TV show as, as the officer is. Mm -hmm. And it, it fascinates me. And I'd, I'd be curious what, what your take is on it. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated with the, the late seventies there kind of with the combination of, um, you know, we need to be thinking about fuel mileage. We need to be thinking about efficiency and yet the big American vehicles, people couldn't, it seemed like they couldn't get enough of them. They were supposed to be downsizing um, with, with the Broncos best selling year there in 79. Uh, but I, if I remember correctly, the Ford Thunderbirds best year was uh, well, the best three years was 77 to 79 when they were some of the biggest cars they've ever been. Yeah. And everybody was talking. I mean, the Thunderbird people, I mean, they revered the 55 to 57, the little, the little two seaters, the best selling Thunderbirds 77 to 79. Those, the, the big, and I'll be honest, I kind of want one. I, I, I keep an <laughs> eye out. I keep an eye out from time to time. If I find a nice one with T tops, I'm probably there. And I'm not ashamed it, to admit it, but it's just, it's a fascinating, it's a fascinating kind of dichotomy there. Well, and the other thing too, is I always get asked, did OJ kill the Bronco? Uh, pun <laughs> intended. Uh, no, we I always get asked about OJ, OJ too. And you know, it was a horrible crime. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, but the Bronco and OJ are forever linked in pop culture, but the yes. Bronco re replacement program had already started. I think it started in 1993 and it later became the expedition. Uh, but what's the difference between the Bronco and the Expedition? Not a whole lot, except it's got two two more doors. Yep. And so the whole reason that you want a Bronco to, to be able to go off-roading if you want to do that, and then but you still have your your four doors and the, the capability to throw your your soccer gear, your hockey gear, your football gear in the back, you know, it just it it it, it solved what the Bronco couldn't. Do you well, have so the for anyone watching right now, we're look. We have a graph here of Bronco sales numbers, and you see 78, 77,917. The year before that, fourteen thousand five hundred and forty-six. The year after that, seventy-seven thousand number for seventy-nine, a hundred and four thousand and thirty-eight. Like late seventies, just people they love the Bronco, like. It, that was the, the second generation. Amazing. They love the second generation. So the yep. first gen, and see, part of it, I, I in my three minute overview, I, I touched on it, but we skipped a generation. When the oil crisis hit, we didn't do our second generation Bronco in 74. Mm -hmm. uh, it was called the Shorthorn Project. It was supposed to happen. It just didn't happen because the uh, economic uncertainty of that particular era. So I, I, I think that's a warning for any automaker that tells you what can happen if you skip uh, a product upgrade and a mm -hmm. and a generational cycle, uh, you can right. end up with numbers like that. What is the total sales number? I, I can't it, see at the it, bottom. Oh, uh, it's a hundred and no one, one million, million one one million one hundred forty eight thousand nine hundred twenty six. That's the that's every Bronco sold, and that is standing. And, uh, you know, consider the Mustang again. We had sold a million by 1966. Yep. The car came out in 1964, uh, April of 64. So that, that tells you the difference in the scale. But Bronco was always, always going to be an, a niche vehicle. It was mm -hmm. going to be a vehicle for people that wanted off-road pleasure, um, four-wheel drive certainty, and honestly, it's an image. And I think that that harkens back to what the Bronco is and why it was the most anticipated auto reveal the past two years, mm -hmm. because the Bronco is a personality. You know, uh, 
people don't wear a watch to wear a watch to tell time. You tell time on your phone. You wear a watch because it says something about you. Oh, I wear an iWatch. I wear a Rolex. I wear this. You know, it becomes a piece of your persona. Mm -hmm. The Bronco is a piece of your persona, just like a Mustang would be, whereas a Ford Fusion isn't. A Ford Fusion is a way to get from here to, to there. But your persona is, is incorporated. So what persona do the newer generations want? Well, even though they haven't seen a Bronco in real life probably in a while, I think that the the coming generations and the newer generations, they like the idea of the off-road. I'm not just going to go to the trailhead. I'm going to go further. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I Ford tapped into uh, something that the Jeep hadn't refreshed as recently. I don't ever want to speak about competition, but there was a, there was a gap there that Ford, once again, just as we did in 1965, we saw a gap and we said, we're going to fill it. I think that we saw a gap in technological and, you know, we, we really, when we put our mind to it, we engineer really cool stuff. And this Bronco is uh, the sport. I've got a sport in my driveway. I can see it right now. Uh, <laughs> and the, the big Bronco are engineered to the nines. We turned it up to 11. Let me do this final tap throw in. <laughs> well, so I had a question for you because there was a vehicle that you shared with us that I personally didn't know about. And I asked Smith and he wasn't so certain about. Did you shared a front and rear image of a uh, a military version of the Bronco? Did right. You know, did this actually get adopted? Like, I've just never seen one of these before. No, so it didn't. It was, it was a prototype. Uh, that was a concept car that was a prototype that was going to be uh, for the military and spec'd out and everything, but the military didn't go for it. And we're not going to, we didn't build cars that, uh, uh, that people don't want. So it didn't happen. Huh. But there's the code name, U150 on that Bronco. That, yeah, I just... I, Honestly, I never knew that was even a thing that yeah. could have happened. And the irony that uh, that Ford had such a big role in the original Jeep, and then and then the army poo pooed this. Hey, that's life. <laughs> yeah, that, that's military contracts. Who knows what well, was the decision was? So, so speaking of of some of these um, more more uh, oddities, I guess we'll say, I don't recall. The Bronco Pope Mobile, <laughs> but but that was that was a thing. The first famous white Bronco is the way I described it. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. Yes. It's a, a 1979 Ford Motor Company gave three Broncos uh, to the Secret Service to be customized as a Pope Mobile, and Pope John Paul II used them on his uh, 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 first trip to America. And there's a great photo of John Paul II and uh, Yankee Stadium. Uh, surrounded by his fans and his uh, modified Bronco Pope mobile. And that's second generation Bronco too, by yeah. the way. Well, we've, we've got a rendering up here um, on the screen. I, I didn't catch the actual photo, but I, I mean, the Bronco Pope mobile, what hasn't the Bronco done? I mean, it's done Baja. Maybe we should talk a little bit about Baja. Was Ford, Ford wasn't specifically involved. Here, Smith, um, I'm sorry. I just real quick, I uh, have to share a, a color image of the actual Pope mobile. Just okay. Because yes. Yes. Please, please do. Please do. I'm getting a, I'm getting a little. No, no. Here. Baja is certainly important in the Broncos history. I'm not poo pooing that at all, but. People need to see, especially with that back. Oops, here. Let me zoom out yeah. a little bit. There we go. <laughs> the um, first famous white Bronco. Exactly. The first famous white Bronco. And I've been looking for that Bronco for a couple of years and haven't been able to find it. Um, we know it was given to the Secret Service by uh, by Ford, but I don't know where they are. Okay. And you see the papal logo on there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's great. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry for the digression. Please. Let's Baja. Talk, uh, Baja. Baja, I think, is a large part of the mystique of what the Ford Bronco is. Uh, because if you think about it, uh, Baja, particularly in the West, in the whole subgenre of off road racing, and Rod Hall and Larry Miner piloted a, a, a production uh, uh, Bronco to overall victory at at that particular year called the Mexican 1000, but the Baja 1000. And it was the first vehicle to win uh, overall as a production uh, four by four. And usually the, uh, the secret on Baja is that usually motorcycles win. 
Uh, they're faster, easier to maintain. Uh, so, and Bronco did win within his class, but think about the, the, the imagery of Rod Hall, Larry Miner, of uh, Pernelli Jones with Big Ollie a few years later, a car that became so famous, it's, a, it's about to be auctioned off for seven figures uh, oh, yeah. at an upcoming auction. You got James Gardner, you've got uh, Mr. Rockford Files himself racing for uh, Ford Broncos at Baja. And you asked about, did we have a direct? Yeah, we did because we provided uh, Bill Strop with the vehicles. In fact, he was okay. provided a pre-production version in 65. Okay. And the very first Baja race actually took place in 65 with a pre-production version okay. of a Bronco. So that was under, he was under contract with this, just like Shelby with the, with the Mustangs. Uh, talk about a pair. You got Bill Strop <laughs> doing Broncos and Shelby doing Mustangs. It's like one, two punch of, of all time. That's right. And the the victories in the constant magazine coverage of Baja and get, created this mystique around the Bronco uh, that, that uh, really enhanced its image as an off-road beast. Now, you had mentioned that there was the second generation smaller Bronco that was planned but didn't happen. Um but didn't, if I remember correctly, Ford offered like a Bronco or like a Baja package around that time. Was that was that connected to, okay, we don't have the second generation coming out, but maybe we can do this Bronco, this, uh, this sorry, this Baja package. It was a way to some interest going. Yeah, it's just a way to breathe life into a brand that, that needed uh, a breath of fresh air. Uh, and then, frankly, that became one of the trademarks of Bronco was trim kits out, you know, became particularly in gens three through five, you know, Oh, we've come out with a new trim kit. You can get the night package, which is uh, purple, but it's so dark. It almost looks black and as this kind of neon stripe, you know, the trim kits became more important than the technology and the vehicles themselves. Um, which is part of the reason of the declining sales. Oh yeah. I love Say that. What one. you will, but that kind of weird gradient of Brown to burnt orange, I know it's super seventies. I know I, I I was born in the it's mid eighties, but though. I still it's love glorious. that. You know, I, free, free will and package. You could get your Grand Torino in those same color schemes. You're it you're looks better here right though. Now. <laughs> I mean, I I don't know if if that era vehicle will ever see big you know big bucks, big values, but but there's a group of people that just that love that era. I mean, I'm one of them. I've, I've searched for years. Well, not really actively searched, but I've kept an eye out for really good quality, like late seventies, maybe very early eighties conversion vans of that era, just because those, gr the graphics were, I mean, that, that's some of the most colorful vehicles you've, you're ever going to see this era. I mean, from the it, factory, certainly fr from the factory. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, it's very uh, centered on a certain period, but uh, Folks, this Ford sold a hundred thousand of those. <laughs> if you if you go to Bronco if you go to Bronco meetups, the they self uh, identify Gen One and Gen Two, or Big Bronco and Small Bronco. And if you go to Facebook and you look the the there's a first gen Bronco Facebook group and a big Bronco Facebook group, and they 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 don't mix well. They're oil and water. Usually <laughs> at Woodward Dream Cruise. The big Broncos are on one side of the street and the small Broncos <laughs> are on the other side of the street. I was, I was uh, about to ask because I'm not too familiar with the enthusiast community, but they definitely, they oh, definitely yeah. don't tend to, uh, huh, where does the Bronco two fit into all of this? The I, Bronco two does, is does everybody hate? Icon. Cause I, I personally, I love the Bronco two. I'm wondering if all the regular Bronco guys hate the Bronco two, but I, I mean, I love, I love them all, but the Bronco two, a friend of mine had a Bronco two, um, in high school. And it was just, I mean, it was, it felt like you could pick it up and put it in your pocket, but it still was kind of capable. I mean, it could still go places that you couldn't go with, with, especially with a little normal Ranger. Yeah. 100% agree. The Bronco two has its own niche and its own, uh, fanatics and followers. And, uh, um, uh, you know, it became so linked with the, with the rollover scandal that the nameplate itself had to go away. And then the re-engineered Explorer came back and uh, quickly became the best-selling SUV of all time. Uh, personally, one of my good friends uh, uh, had a Bronco, too, and loved it. It was also a little trivia. It was also the first Ford vehicle to sport the Eddie Bauer trim kit. Um, was it really? Oh, that yeah. was the first one? Okay. That was the I first one. That. So, Ted, I have to tell you. 
yeah. I grew up the first the first two cars I remember riding in as a child are a Ford Tempo and a Ford Bronco two. And the Tempo, I don't remember lasting super long, but the Bronco too, I actually even talked to my dad because I knew we were doing this interview today. And he said it was a great truck. He, you know, they used it to haul snowmobiles. Um, and I asked him, he said he was pretty sure ours was an 87. Although I swear it looked like uh, an 89 and Unfortunately, that image isn't going to load for me. But <laughs> yeah, uh, so yeah, I, I I I remember super vaguely the whole rollover scandal, but they worked for my family. So they yeah, I, I remember this scandal, and it's I mean, how how many people were putting just even minor lifts on these things, and it's like uh, th- this isn't this isn't something that you really want to lift up, guys. Oh, yeah, actually, here we go. Here is an '89, which, as I remember, that is the exact color scheme of the one that we had when I was a kid. Um, you know, I mean, I can't address the rollover scandal in particulars, but you know, the uh, pe- things were happening to the vehicles that shouldn't be happening to them, yep. and making them uh, not as safe. Which is one of the reasons. I mean, everybody sees all of the disclaimers, and you get so sick of disclaimers on TV commercials. Um, Closed poor, uh, course, professional driver, blah, blah, blah. But it, I mean, it's reality, guys. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you shouldn't take a, a car and get all four wheels off the ground unless you know good, well, what you're doing. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and you know, you're talking about the Explorer. And I think this can kind of dovetail also into how the, uh, the Bronco sales were declining, as you said, through the 90s. But as you said, I mean, people, they wanted four doors. So you had the Explorer that was coming out that kind of, I, I mean, the Explorer was smaller, but it still kind of took that Bronco place. And then you had the Expedition. Um, I'm going to share this. I want to share this photo with everybody here because you were talking about the Explorer and the Bronco too. And when I first saw this, I was like, oh, that's a, that's a two-door Explorer. And I was like, oh, wait, no. That was a Bronco two prototype from right. from 1990, and I mean, that's, I mean, how closely tied uh, to the Bronco two was the Explorer at that point? Because to me, I mean, if I were to see this, it's like, oh, that's a two door Explorer. It it was tied to it, but different engineering, different uh, different capability studies, for lack of a better word, and and freed up from the Ranger platform. Uh, at the same time, which which gave them more capability and or, or more ability to do different things w- with the design of the vehicle, I do love seeing those photos like that. And uh, look we'll at the the back window is a dead giveaway too. Yeah, the back right one where, where you see that diagonal pillar. What um that that Bruce? What does that remind you of? Um, something Japanese from the era, and I I, I it's can't. A Suzu, I, isn't it? Isn't it? Okay, yeah, maybe 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 you're thinking of Suzu. Is it an Amica? No, it's I, not I, an Amico. It's, it's, it's slipping my mind as well. But that was, yeah, the, Ted, that was the first thing that kind of popped into my mind is, you know, look how that, uh, you know, look how, how the rear quarter and the pillar back there is a uh, is, is shaped. It's, huh, it's, a, it's another cool aspect of Bronco history. So as we're kind of wrapping up here, I want to move. I, I have two images that I found that are both very evocative to me. And one of them I, I, I hope is going to kind of spawn some interesting conversation. Ted, do you know, so the 2004 Bronco (laughs) concept was, so 2004, I was either a senior in high school or a freshman in college, depending on when it came out. And I remember this thing being just the hottest thing on the internet of that time when it debuted. And everyone wondered why it never happened. And do you have any insight about why like a vehicle that was critically like that, you know, people liked the looks of why it never actually happened. I do. And it's golly, the poor, there was a group at Ford called the Bronco underground mm-hmm. and the Bronco underground. Uh, there's been a couple of stories written about them and you can, you can look them up there. The Bronco underground were, were Ford employees who wanted the Bronco back and took every opportunity to, to fight, to get the Bronco back. And the 04 uh, prototype, I believe, was designed by Maury Callum, who just retired from Ford. And it was one of his crowning achievements. 
and he loved that vehicle. And it ran into the, 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 the one of the things about automobile manufacturing is you have to have a, a subframe, you know, we platform. I've been talking about Ranger platform and F-150. You have to have a platform. You have to have a plant that has capability or capacity. Uh, you have to have a design. You have to have a marketing budget. You have to, all the stars have to align before you get the checkbox on the program to go forward. That one was going to go forward, but ran into issues with uh, platforming. Uh, they couldn't get the platform and they couldn't get the capacity. And then the 08 a downturn happened and it was uh, goodbye. It's, the Bronco Underground, I mean, my gosh, they, these poor people, they had their souls <laughs> ripped out of their bodies time after. They would get this beautiful prototype done, ready. Oh, here we're going to go. We've got it. And then a downturn happened or a management change took place or a new, we got a new CEO who it wasn't his pet peeve project anymore. And then boom, Bronco's gone again. Uh, so it, it took them <laughs> nearly 20 years, but they finally got it back. There, there was a little bit of that at Ford at the time. I remember um, I actually yeah. hired in at uh, at PCG Campbell to work with uh, SVT, the you know the the T part, uh, the, the marketing side. Uh, SVE was of course on the Ford side. SVT was the was Campbell side. I hired in, and like right after I hired in, Ford decided to mainstream it all, take it all internal. So all of a sudden. I was hired for a position that didn't exist anymore. And that's kind of when the Ford performance group started. There was, there was a, there was a lot happening right around that kind of that window with, with the Bronco there. Um, if I remember correctly, there was supposed to be something with, they were going to do something special with a fusion that didn't happen. And, and yeah, it's, it, that was a, that was an interesting time to be at Ford. I'm, I'm not saying that it was always amazing, but I, it was, it was kind of cool to be kind of center stage during all of that change that was happening. All I'm going to so, say is any car, any car that makes it from drawing board to nameplate to public sale is it's, it's lucky. Yeah. That's a, really that's is. a great photo. Yeah. That's just what kind of something I wanted to end on is that I, I just thought this was one of the photos you sent us. It's just a beautifully romantic photo. It shows, you know, a couple together in the sunset Bronco behind them. Um, I'll zoom out here a little and you can see that, there's a little bit of a there's a hint of a hill behind them and yeah that that's i think that says a lot about the bronco is that it's supposed to take people places that are off-road where they can be alone to get to the trailhead and beyond i'm guessing on yeah. you would that be around 77 or so you know your image didn't say i uh, it's it's around 77 because it's okay. still got the first generation body style but it's a later version of it uh okay. no and, but that 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 ethos is 100 correct if you want if you want the capability to go off road the bronco will get you to the trailhead and with the new technologies and the new uh function it will get you beyond uh the trailhead wherever you want to go and bravo yeah. to ford on that uh, on that media shot <laughs> <laughs> usually it's the vehicle is front and center and usually when it's not us journalists complain about it but this is so artfully done you know what that's that probably did more for bronco than you know a, a hardcore climbing up a hillside image i don't know i'm guessing i'm guessing that's Maybe a brochure just romantic in me i'm guessing that's a brochure can well, i tell one one really quick story out of the super quick, oh, yeah. yeah go ahead super you got quick. it Okay, the uh, it's one of the documents that you'll see. There. The the G O A T goes over any terrain mm -hmm. feasibility I did study. See that, yeah. So the marketing team and the design team loved that, and, and it became because Ford was building the MUT. We knew the Army acronyms goes over all terrain, goes over mm -hmm. any terrain. It doesn't mean Tom Brady, but the marketing <laughs> folks fell in love with it. And so all the different drive modes for both the Bronco Sport and the Bronco are called GOAT modes. Mm -hmm. It goes over any type of train. And that is a direct result of a marketing guy walking through, holding up a document in the archives going, I love this, guys. Let's do it. To the point that Winding Kennedy has uh, ads with the goats uh, running around with, with horses. Uh, That's great. And it that goes over any train philosophy uh -huh. that uh, was pulled out of the DNA of a 1963 document. Cool. Well, Ted, uh, thank you for being with us tonight. We've learned a lot about Bronco. We've, you know, we've looked at a lot of fantastic images. Do you have, I, I, 
you know, I don't know how it works with you guys. Do you have any like social media you want people to follow? Do you have any Bronco stuff you want people to follow? Do you, do you have any closing messages for us? Yeah, social media. If you want to see interesting photos from the Ford archives, I don't, I don't post all that much, but when I do, it's usually good. Okay. Um, <laughs> is at uh, Ted Ryan 64. Cool. Uh, and on Twitter and uh, don't have an Instagram presence there, but at Ted Ryan 64 on Twitter and a lot of times when I've been cataloging the concept car negs and if I see an interesting concept car, I've just been tossing them out there. So right. you can get some content you've never seen before. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. It's been yes. a fantastic episode of rambling about cars and good afternoon, good evening and tonight. Whenever you're listening to us, we thank you for listening to us. So bye-bye. See ya.